St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge is known for the many varieties of birds that call it home, but there's lots more to see in this vast coastal area. We'll visit there today on Florida Natural. Hi, I'm Carolee Boyle Sprinkle. We're here today at St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge with wildlife biologist Red Giddens. Red, what's significant about this area that the federal government set aside as a wildlife refuge? Well, back in the early days of the refuge system down there, especially starting in the 30s, they acquired a lot of lands for uh, migratory waterfowl, both nesting areas up north, areas through which they passed on their north and south migrations and then wintering areas. And probably the most significant part of St. Mark's from the standpoint of the wintering ducks would be the uh, shallow Appalachian Bay that supports a substantial uh, bed of seagrasses that are fed on by the birds. How big is the wildlife refuge area? About 64,500 acres of land. It's pretty evenly divided between marshes and uh, upland or wooded areas and then an additional 31,500 acres in Appalachian Bay that's close to the hunting of migratory waterfowl. That's really a big area. It's one of the larger ones in Florida. When was it established? In 1930, 31. 31. Well, what's this area that we're standing next to out here? This is a typical tidal salt marsh that's found along this section of uh, Florida composed primarily of a single species, uh, Juncus romerianus, common name is either black rush or needle rush. And this type of marsh down there being tidal, now it's really important there from the uh, overall estuarine situation in as the plant material dies and is washed out, it starts the uh, food chain, which fed on, I guess, primarily by plankton and other mm -hmm. microscopic invertebrate life, which goes on to feed larger uh, invertebrates that are fed on by the immature, well, shrimp and a number of commercially and sport important fisheries. Oh, what's the bird coming in out there? Uh, see, it's eastern, eastern king bird. It's one of about four flycatchers that we have in this, this area there. Moves a lot like the great crested flycatcher. Right, yes. It's normally found in a little bit more open area. I think your great crested normally stays in a little bit more of a wooded, mm -hmm. wooded area there. What other animals and wildlife are typical of the habitats here on St. Mark's? Well, depending on the uh, habitat type, we have, a, like I mentioned, a wide variety of habitats starting out there in the open bay, working through your tidal marshes to some of the managed fresh and brackish water marshes all the way up to uh, longleaf pine scrub oak ridges. And with this diversity of habitat here, there's quite a wide variety of uh, migratory and resident uh, wildlife species. As a matter of fact, there's been over 300 different species of birds recorded on the refuge since it was uh, mm. established. It's a long list. It is. They're quite, quite diverse there. Do you have any records of any panthers out here? Uh, nothing that we can uh, actually substantiate. Now, we do get reports from time to time, and there's a distinct possibility there could be a panther in this area since the majority of the uh, coastline is pretty well wooded and uh, uninterrupted from about Swanee River on, well, the other side of Apalachicola. And the animals are quite secretive, so it's not, you know, beyond reason that there could be some up here. Well, I'd like to walk on down and see what else we can find. Okay, great. We can look at some of the managed impoundments. Okay. There are other wetlands down there, just a little bit Sounds good. different there. Now, is this dry area that we're walking on a man-made area, or is it natural? Uh, yes, it is. It's a man-made area. It's part of our so-called diversion canal dike, where we flow water from uh, one managed pool to the other. But with the exception of the uh, Pensacola Bahia grass that's planted for dike stabilization, all the other plants you see over here are typical of your uh, pine islands that are scattered throughout the marsh. So this is pretty much a natural type of area then? Right, yes. 
Oh, is that a thistle? Yes, it certainly is. And the thistle down there is one of the earlier blooming flowers out here. It's quite important to the uh, little ruby-throated hummingbird and as well as insects such as honeybees and uh, bumblebees. It's kind of amazing here in the southeast with the wide variety of flowers we have that we only have one common species of hummingbird. Or out west where you consider it primarily desert there that there's a large number of species. I see dewberries blooming too. And yes, some with some fruit right. on them. Again, they're probably one of the earlier fruiting plants down there and quite important to uh, wide variety of your wildlife species, box turtles, old bob white quail, and a number of other bird species there. And these plants we're looking at out here down there, that tall, dark green one is the uh, red cedar. It's a good indicator of uh, a situation where you don't have fires. It's very fire intolerant. These other plants down there the, with the bright green leaves, the larger leaves, the wax myrtle, the one with the smaller one is a uh, yopon. Later on, it'll have red berries that are fed on by, again, quite a wide variety of uh, bird and small animal life. What's calling right out there? I'm really not sure I heard heard it, but uh, well, maybe as we I get don't down recognize there, we it. We might uh, be able to flush it out when we get down there. What is this area that we're going into? It's uh, your tidal salt marsh. Again, composed primarily of a single species there in the uh, major portion of the marsh. It's needle rush. If you want to feel the tip of one of the stems, you'll see why it's named that. Uh -huh. Quite, quite sharp. Boy, it really is. You punch a nice hole in here. Mm -hmm. Is this area normally dry or does it flood? Uh, it'll flood occasionally, but it's not flooded by every uh, high tide since I see. it's in quite a ways from your uh, tidal water. And we ha do have two, normally two low and two high tides a day. And by the time the tidal water comes up here, normally it's starting to fall back. When a real strong, say, southeast wind, this will, will be flooded. But you notice it's almost pure sand there, and when it, it does flood, the water percolates rather rapidly and evaporates, and these sandy areas are indicative of real high salt content compared to your uh, tidal marsh. Oh, there's a little nest over there. It's Watch out that. bending down. These are really sharp and they'll put a put an eye out. It's a long bill marsh wren nest. Notice it's covered on top with the opening down here. This is one of about three species that normally nest in your tidal salt marsh here. The long bill marsh wren, seaside sparrow, and the clapper rail. Is this related to like the Carolina wren or is it totally uh, different? Right, it's in, in the same family, but it's, it's uh, they're all, all related. I'm not sure whether it's in the same genus or not. But uh, another species we'll find occasionally out here would be the uh, least bittern. But uh, as far as I know, they'll nest primarily in fresher marshes there. So there's really just about three species that uh, nest here. What other kinds of wildlife are typical of this kind of in-between area? Well, in here we'll find uh, several different species of snails, including the marsh, marsh periwinkle. And probably the most common or at least obvious one is the little, uh, little crab down there, the fiddler crab. Some of this digging down here is probably where raccoons have been digging for the uh, for the crabs. A little bit higher up, we should find some of the little burrows that the crabs make. Oh, is this one of the snails? Right, yes. I'm not sure which species that is, but they seem to be found a lot commoner up here in your higher sandy areas. Here's another common snail that's normally found around the uh, higher sandy areas. And the most common one, or at least most obvious, is little marsh periwinkle, litter rhino, but it's normally found 
close to the tidal creeks and out towards the bay where it'll feed up and down on the stems depending on tide and feeds, I guess, primarily on algae that's attached to the uh, stems of the emergent vegetation. In this area here probably has a wider selection of small plants down there than when you get out into your principal part of the marsh. It's predominantly or almost exclusively the uh, needle rush, while here we have different plants such as this one. They're not in flower now, but that would be the uh, sea oxide, Boracea, and other common ones. Salt joint grass, disticulus, it's usually indicative of a little higher marsh area that's not flooded daily. And these just starting to come up. Well, here's some last year's growth is the uh, saltwort, excuse me, glasswort, salicornia. And this is this year's growth here where they're just starting to germinate in the sand. And all of these plants that we're looking at are quite salt tolerant. You might also notice there on the uh, needle rush or black rush that as they move out into these salt barrens, these are probably about as tall as they'll grow. And getting back out into a less saline area, they'll grow a lot taller. And this is the bloom? The bloom, right. It's uh, flowering there. Well, there's several other plants normally found out here. I don't see any right at this spot there. There's salt warts and the sea lavenders and other plants that normally grow back in and into the uh, needle rush. This might be that other snail that we're... Oh. Here's a couple oh. little crabs down there. Fiddler uh -huh. crab, the large one, with the one with the large claw is a male. This other one, I believe, it's not the same genus as this one. Oh. It looks more like a female. It's probably a different uh, species or possibly a different family, but they're both typically found, again, on these higher areas. They'll make little burrows, such as this one here, and at high tide, they'll go into the burrow and plug it up, so they actually have plenty of uh, oxygen. As the tide goes down, then they'll come out. They feed as far as I know, exclusively on dead plant material, probably, possibly some uh, algae also. And these holes, again, as I mentioned earlier about the high tides coming in occasionally, of course, they assist in, you know, percolation of water. That's, in general, about the tidal salt marsh here, we can go to a, okay. another type, one of our managed impoundments, which are either uh, brackish or fresh at the present time, and look at the difference in the plant life and hopefully some of the related uh, wildlife, the larger species Okay, here. let's do that. Carol Lee, this is one of our managed impoundments here. I believe I mentioned earlier when the refuge was first established, we were primarily just wintering waterfowl was our only uh, objective. But through the years, we've changed to uh, all managing for endangered species plus all your native and migratory birds. And as a result, we've had to change quite a few of our management practices. And today we have several ponds that are quite deep and fresh or brackish, others that are brackish and shallow for wintering waterfowl food and uh, small forage fish. Then others, such as this one here, we're managing it in, as an entirely freshwater uh, impoundment, primarily for nesting herons and egrets, your colonial nesting birds. Bird life changes with uh, each season of the year. Right now, we still have a few migrants such as the little Sora rail, uh, but a majority of the birds that we see in here now are s at least summer residents. Some of them leave during the winter and some 
stay here year round, such as the uh, common gallinule or common moorhen as it's known now. The little eastern kingbird next to it down there is a uh, summer resident nesting species that'll leave generally in around August or September. Others that we have out here, I believe they're primarily snowy egrets is one of the the large white ones back in there are, is one of the species we're trying to manage this impoundment for us, a nest, nesting area, as we mentioned a little earlier. Another one that comes in and nests during the uh, spring and summer is the osprey. And in addition to these down there, the uh, common moorhen, red-winged blackbirds, least bittern, and uh, others like the um, boat tail grackle and other resident birds down there nest here, as well as uh, wood ducks down there. If we don't see one, at least we can see the uh, several of the nest boxes. Now, while these boxes are put out for... Uh, oh, that's what these boxes are that are sticking up on posts. Right, yes, ma'am. And although we're, they're put out exclusively for wood ducks, we'll also get purple martins, great crested flycatchers, and uh, other species of birds birds using them. Are the gallinules and the, the rail, are they really walking on the water, or is there something under there they're walking on? Uh, they're walking on the uh, floating plant material in some places. Now, that one out there is probably on a little tussock or floating mat of dead vegetation. But with their webbed feet, they are able to uh, walk on just water lily pads. As a matter of fact, it's quite interesting if you haven't uh, seen it before to watch them with the young. They'll literally use one foot to pick up the lily pad to expose the insects underneath for the young to uh, feed on. And in addition to the birds, of course, a marsh of this type down there has other uh, aquatic or semi-aquatic animals such as the round-tailed muskrat and a pretty good population of alligators. They both nest and feed in this type of an area there. Oh, here's Robin Will, our outdoor recreation planner, Caroline. And uh, I hate to do this to y'all, but I've got to run. I've got another appointment, and Robin's going to take over from here on the other habitat types. I certainly enjoyed it there. And Thank you very much for showing us around this morning, Ray. You're welcome there. Bye, -bye. Bye now. Robin, do you know how many people visit St. Mark's every year? Yes, I do, Carolee. We have about 300,000 annual visitors that come to St. Mark's. Of course, a lot of them come for different reasons. Some of them are Audubon or bird watchers. A lot of them fish down here. And we have quite a few students from Leon and Wakulla counties that come down to use the outdoor classroom facilities. But this year, we had a special treat. And that was the fact that we had a southern bald eagle nest within viewing distance from the trail that we're standing on. And this gave the visitor a chance to come in, set up their spotting scope, and really get a bird's eye view of how a southern bald eagle nests and how they rear their young. And this year we have one eaglet who is sitting up in the tree right now keeping a sharp eye on us. And of course this is one of the parents that's over mm -hmm. on the, the nest tree over to the right. And eagles, like other large bird of prey, take care of their young equally. They, say, they share the, uh, the caring for the young, which a lot of the other wild animals don't do. As soon as they mate, the male will leave and the female will be left to take care of the young herself. But in the bald eagle family, they all share. So we don't know whether that's the male or the female that's up there on the nest tree at this time. What do they feed the young? Usually little pieces of fish that they tear up in bite-sized pieces for the young, and also dead birds. A lot of times they'll find a dead turtle out on the highway, and they'll bring that back and shred it up and feed the young. And it'll be about another two or three weeks before the young is big enough to fly and, and, and fend for itself, look for its own food. Is one per nest typical, or do they raise more than that generally? Um, I believe the average eggs that they lay is about three eggs, and of those, probably about one survive. And sometimes even if there's two eaglets that are raised at the beginning, the older or stronger eaglet will kick off the weaker one and uh, will end up being the only one to survive. So they have a, a very low ratio of reproductive success, which is why they're in one of the endangered species. How often do they reproduce? Do they reproduce annually, or is it less Usu frequently? Usually they just reproduce the one time per year, but there have been occasions where there have been two hatchings just because of a, a late start or an early start and then another late hatching later on. 
And um, last year we did have a young eaglet that was brought off at late April, which is very unusual because most of the eaglets are born in January or February, and this one was born in February. And, but then it, that same pair will reproduce next year. There's not a... We hope so. <laughs> we hope this nest is still here. They do come back to the same nest each year if it's standing. And of course the perilous part of this nest is that it's in a dead tree which means it may not be there next year when the eagles come back. So we're hoping that they'll find another suitable tree near a large body of water where they fish. And of course, they like to be near waterfowl too. That's one of their primary food staples is ducks and fish. Can we get around any closer to them and see them? Yeah, why don't we just take the trail on okay. around up this way and we'll get in closer so you can see the nest. How many eagles are there here on the refuge? We have six nesting pairs this year, which is our highest nesting number that we've had in the last 50 years at the refuge. And of course, this is the one you can get to the most, the easiest, so that's the one that we tell our visitors to come see. And it really means a lot for them to see an, an eagle so close up, the way you can see it there. Do they nest all over Florida, or is this a unique situation? Well, they nest quite a, quite a bit up along the coast, along the Gulf Coast and down towards the Everglades. In fact, I believe the Wakaba River is a big nesting area for eagles. Of course, St. Mark's is, you know, we, we have several that nest on the salt marsh as well as the fresh pools. That's our big claim to fame is that we have salt marsh eagles as well as freshwater eagles. Do the juveniles start out with the white head and tail, or is that something that comes with maturity? Or? Yeah, that comes about four or five years as they grow older. They'll get the white head and the characteristic white tail. And right now, the little eaglet's about brown and fuzzy, and he has a, a golden beak. So he's already changed since when he was first hatched out. He was about the size of a small ostrich, kind of white and fluffy. So he's already changed his feathers one time. How long will he stay with the parents? Once he starts flying, is he on his own or do they continue no. to feed him? Or? Yeah, he'll hang around the parents for at least a year. In fact, he'll be back next year when they start to nest if they let him. And usually the adult male or female will spook off the juvenile and keep them away from the nesting female because they don't want to disturb her. So he needs to find his own mate and eventually he will. He or she will mate. Let's take a look at another habitat, Carolee. Okay. One that's unique here at the refuge. This habitat that we're walking through is unique because we haven't seen it yet on the refuge, and it's called a hardwood hammock. But before we get up to the hardwood area, let's talk about some of the beautiful spring flowers we have at St. Mark's. And this is the St. John's wort, beautiful yellow plant. And then this small leaf plant right here is a small, a low bush blueberry. And several of them do have the fruit already coming out. You can see the little fruit that do turn into blueberries. And that's the edible blueberry now that you're talking about? Right, that is edible, just like the larger blueberry that most of us are used to seeing commercially in the stores. And this is saw palmetto, big fan-shaped blades. And then we have some vaccinium, which the bees are really tearing up right now. They smell so sweet. They're really having a field day, aren't they? And you can see the small bell-shaped blossoms. And of course, you can detect the plant immediately by the odor. Something unique about these vaccinians is the galls that they're producing. And they look almost like a bloom. They're so oh, they delicate. They sure do. We have someone from Florida State University down here that's studying nothing but these um, unusual developments. They're caused, we think, by a virus. And they're not even a, a fruiting structure or a bloom. They're just a, an extra piece of the vegetation that's developed by this virus. The bees that are out here, are these um, domestic bees that someone's brought onto the refuge, or are they wild bees? We have both types here at St. Mark's. We have three beekeepers that bring colonies out in the early spring to take advantage of blooms, just like you see on the vaccinium. We also have wild bees, and they make their hives in the cavities of large trees, and of course also compete for the 
nectar of these flowers. And the biggest problem the beekeepers have here is, of course, the bears, because the bears will come into their area, even if they have an electric fence around it, and will tear through the colonies and eat the honey. I didn't realize there were even any bears here. The bears are very secretive, and uh, a lot of people are disappointed because they don't get to see these large mammals when they come to the refuge, the bears and the deer and the bobcat. And of course, most of them are nocturnal. They come out at night. So the visitors really have to get down here at unusual hours to see animals like that. This is a live oak grove, Carolee, and something we haven't talked about yet, the value of these live oak trees to the migratory birds. Up in the branches, we can hear hundreds of warblers that have moved in here as part of the spring migration. These live oaks look like they've had a fire through them. I didn't think they'd survive fire. Well, we were surprised. We had a, a wildfire that came in here and burned out the entire grove. And for a while, we were afraid we were going to lose all the trees. And you can see several of the branches still have not come back and probably won't. But they proved very resilient to fire. And you can see most of the bark of, of the trunks is quite charred, including the, the bark of the pine tree right here, mm -hmm. which is also charred. But that was a, a big accident. And unfortunately, we lost most of the nature trail that's on beyond the oak grove as well as some of the younger oaks. This is a muscadine grapevine, and it's very similar to the domestic variety of muscadine. And I don't know if you've ever tried the muscadine grape jelly or mm -hmm. any wine. It has a real pungent, strong flavor to it. It's very sweet. And uh, the new Lafayette Vineyards up in Tallahassee will let you taste their muscadine wine that they have, and it has a very good flavor to it. Well, we've seen a lot of habitats. Have we seen all of them, or are there others here on St. Mark's that we haven't had a chance to visit today? There is a lot more to St. Mark's than what we've seen today, but something that's nice to note is the fact that wherever we've come in on the refuge is a place that's easily accessible to most of our visitors, including even people that are elderly and also small children, because we're less than a quarter mile from the paved road. And most people like to explore the wilderness, but they want to make sure they're close enough to their car that in case an emergency happens or an insect bite or something, they can get back to the car. And Tallahassee is so close, and, and yet most of our visitors come from out of town. And this is really hard to explain, especially to mm -hmm. a lot of the local people here. But we have visitors from different countries, about 23 different countries each year. And of course, most of the major states in the United States come to visit. So St. Mark's has got a lot to offer, both to local people and from people out of town. And of course, all the different habitats are important to to preserve and important to wildlife. Right. Our primary objective is now endangered species preservation. So the fact that we have a diverse habitat allows for the bald eagle to come here and nest and also allows the American alligator to sun on the bank and the eastern indigo snake to live up in some of the sand ridges like where we are right now. This would be great indigo habitat. So endangered species being the primary goal, managing for diverse habitats is the best way to go. You provide a little of everything. I think eventually refuges will become almost an oasis, you know, just a sample of uh, unique habitats preserved. And I'm hoping that we will not be surrounded by a big city, but the thought's in my mind that as we keep growing more and more, the wildlife refuges will really be a sample of what was there, the native habitats. We won't be a bush gardens or, you know, a Disney World, but we'll be a place where people can come and, and walk through natural areas that, are, that have been saved for the wildlife. Well, Robin, I sure appreciate you coming around and showing us all these habitats. Well, I've enjoyed it. Y'all have to come much. back. <laughs> we have a lot more to see. <laughs> I would like to take a walk on the nature trail. Would you show me where that is? Sure. We're very close. We're within a couple of feet. 